Yes, hello everyone and welcome to all our West Australian football fans for the final time in season 2024. It's our special season review. That was the season that was 2024. And today we're going to look at some of the best games of the year, the best players of season 2024 and the ups and downs of your WAFL team over the last six months. Paul Persick with you alongside Ethan Roth. It's a bit sad, uh, this episode. It's the very last one for the year. It is, Paul, yeah. It's a bit of a lull around with summer, you know, upon us now. But I think that just reflects on how great of a season it's been, how much we'll miss it, and uh, how much we're already eager for 2025. Oh, we're already looking forward to 2025. You better believe it. It is going to be another great season. But 2024 was one of excitement aplenty in the WAFL. Crowds were great, great matches, and uh, we saw plenty of stars shine on the big stage. We did, and we'll get into that soon. But, uh, yeah, and the closest season in, in you know, recent memory as well so all clubs having plenty of highs as well so yeah that's a big bonus certainly is uh listeners and viewers you can check us out on our socials facebook twitter and instagram and you can also check us out on youtube and where you get your podcasts it's around the waffle that was the season that was 2024 First thing we're going to do, Rothy, is uh, take a look at some of the ups and downs of each of the WAFL teams. Uh, listeners and viewers, you can have your say as well. Whatever club you support, let us know uh, some of your highlights and lowlights of uh, of the season in 2024. We'll start things off with Claremont. Up, second half of the season, it was incredible. There were questions on uh, whether they would even make the five, having won two of their first, only two of their first six games. But then to team brilliantly and win nine of their last 11 and make fifth place and get into the finals was simply sensational. That was a big up. Yeah, they looked in very uh, big trouble early on in the season, didn't they? A lot of people were sort of saying, oh, the run's over. But then to win nine from 11, as you said, was uh, was all class and... Um, yeah, I guess probably the down was just their inaccuracy in key matches, uh, including that first semi-final. Yeah, absolutely. Six goals, 12 doesn't win you a game. But I don't think their season should be defined by that one game. I think it was their rise back up to contention when everyone was saying, as you pointed out, that the rain was over. I don't think it's over just yet. I reckon there's still going to be a couple more years where that window is open, but it's narrowly shutting. But uh, they unearthed some good young players uh, in that squad that really formed a big key. Munguru Frederick, who came over from Sturt, played uh, a vital role down back. And Hamish Davis, late in the season, kicking a couple of big bags of goals in the uh, last couple of games that he had in the season, likely to get drafted later this year. East from Adel is next up. The up, they made the five under very tough circumstances again, obviously having to train and play at different grounds, but also the four-point penalty that they had to start with due to the salary cap breach. Really a great effort by Billy Monaghan's boys under enormous pressure. Yeah, anytime you start with a zero-point you know, deficit, you're, you're really going to have to do something pretty incredible to really make the finals because, you know, we, I said off the top, it's the closest season in history. One game can sort of uh, define your season almost. So, um, yeah, making the five was a brilliant effort, you know, also given the circumstances uh, surrounding their ground and all that sort of thing, you know, a lot of sort of uh, resilience shown in that aspect and that probably is the down, you know, the East Road Council repeatedly screwing with the team, you could say. Oh, I'm, I'm saying harsh, that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's harsh. I think it's fact. You know, it's they're repeatedly messing with the club, you know, despite their ground ready to go and the fact that there was a story brewing that, uh, you know, that uh, the council wouldn't allow the shark to be displayed on the logo. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you know, from a fan's point of view, I reckon the council deserve a smack in the face for repeatedly screwing with the team. That's the only big down. But another up we can add to that was the rise of Lockie Blackiston. Will he get drafted later this year? Yeah, well, fingers crossed from their point of view. They'd love to see him get drafted from a ruck so, st- st- uh, ruck stocks point of view, I should say. He uh, would, you know, would they'd love to keep him. So, um, yeah, that was a real revelation, him coming into the team, sort of um, rising star of the competition, you can always say, if, he, if there was an award for that. So. If, if he doesn't get picked up in the draft, I reckon that'll be a big bonus for East Fremantle. They'd so. love to keep him for next year. East Perth. The up for the runners-up of this year. The return to form of big Scotty Jones in the ruck. Last year, of course, he broke his leg in round nine, didn't play again, came back and was a rampaging bull in the ruck. He had 50 hit-outs in the grand final, and he had a monstrous 82 in the final before, the second semi-final. He was complimented well by the on-ballers, Mitch Crowden, Stan Wright also, Angus Schumacher and Sam Van Diemen to an extent as well. So their midfield, led by Scotty Jones, was uh, calibre. But I think you would agree the only down was saving their worst performance of the year from this past Sunday. Yeah, and they were in the game and, you know, inaccuracy just, just caught the, cost them in crucial moments. But, yeah, Scotty Jones, uh, 
he, I think his follow-up work really improved as well. You know, he did just more than just the tap work. You mentioned the hit-outs, but I think, you know, even, um, you know, pressing to hit the scoreboard looked a bit more dangerous on that front as well. So I think he added more strings to his bows. Mm, I reckon he's going to be in for another big year in 2025 is Scotty Jones. Peel Thunder, the now premiers of the WAFL. Not a lot of big downs, really, you know, apart from losing Jacob Blight in the mid-season draft. That posed at the time to be a really big blow because, uh, you know, he was a key intercept marker. We, we touted that he was going to be a high draft pick, but we just didn't know how much value he presented to Peel Thunder until he got picked up. You know, when we were, when we were looking at Peel Thunder's form midway through the season, when Jacob Blight got picked up, there's, there was going to be added responsibility to some of the other backmen. And the big up, along with their final series, was Michael Selwood. I thought he was magnificent in the back line, really filling the big shoes that Jacob Blight left mid-season. Uh, his intercept marking, his work down back was really a key. And that to add to their big up, their major up, how they team brilliantly in the finals after losing to Swan Districts. Yeah, the, the synergy between the non uh, Dockers players and the Dockers players really came together and, and they flourished in that aspect. And uh, yeah, their defence as well stood up. You know, guys like Ethan Hughes, you know, it's a luxury to have someone of his experience in the side. And um, Hugh Davies, you know, will be better for, for winning a premiership at such a young age. So um, yeah, it's uh, all signs point to, you know, a bit more success, not only this year, but Pe- Peel Thunder, uh, watch out for, for many years to come. Absolutely. Peel Thunder, they had a big, big finals campaign that led to a well-deserved premiership. Now the Demons, their big up was the sprinkling of interstate talent that came over from uh, the other state leagues, led by Charlie Constable, who'd won a premiership at the Gold Coast VFL side 12 months ago. Now he came into the Perth side, started well, was a little bit inconsistent, but I think a big positive for that was the young talent that are shining through at Perth. Yeah, guys like Cashard, Scoble, you know, they continue to get guys, games into these guys, um, Jed Kemp as well, I think. You know, it wasn't up, but it was also a down with the injuries to Constable as well throughout that mid part of the year and, and Simpson as well. But if they can keep those guys moving forward, you know, do you think they'll only be better for it? Um, I, don't think, I don't think the injuries were the biggest down, to be honest with you. I think it was the resignation of Peter German, the sudden resignation after they yeah. lost to Subiaco when they capitulated in the second half when they had a chance of winning. Honestly, from where I was at the time, I did not see that coming because I thought German was going to really be the one to rescue the Demons. But, uh, you know, as it turned out, the results didn't go, you know, the way that he had hoped. He's a great coach, but uh, I think, uh, you know, he just got dealt a bad hand as, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think any time a coach leaves with a year to run on his contract, it probably comes as a surprise to say the least but uh nevertheless uh these things happen so they'll move forward with a new coach and uh yeah perth uh you know we always say it but um i, I don't think it's all sort of doom and gloom for them no nah, it isn't there's uh there's gonna there never is never re- it really is in football you know there's always going to be some ups amongst a, a tough season south Fremantle also had a tough season but their up was how they teamed to stay alive in the finals race after a season of hell obviously losing young talented man nick campo you know good talented midfielder who was sadly killed middle of the year um obviously tyler Rowe being seriously injured uh, in that same incident and losing john todd as well after the WA Day round. I mean, how they team brilliantly to rise up to the to those challenges. You know, it's a matter of life and death and you have to play a game just days later. You know, it weighs in on, on your mind, but the players and, and, the, and the coaching staff and the leadership group really rose up to keep themselves in touch with the finals race. And that's something that the Bulldogs can be credited for tremendously. They can, yeah. Rising as a club um, during, you know, a season of hell really off the field and, uh, yeah, we saw some some real growth from their younger players, a bit like Perth, you know, guys coming through and getting a league opportunity. Um, guys like Ashton Ferreira continue to play, um, you know, Rowan O'Hare, um, Chase Bourne, these guys have sort of been... And Isaiah Winder as well. Yeah, Isaiah Winder, who's just sort of... Uh, yeah, he sort of shot up um, after coming, you know, down from the AFL. So, um, yeah, I think... The only down, really. I mean, their season remained alive after round 21, obviously in the hands of Claremont, and uh, only for 24 hours they were... were, were seen out, but at least, you know, they did win their final game, um, and then, you know, destiny was sort of out of their hands from there. And of course, uh, Craig White, now the new coach at South Fremantle, what's going to be in store under his leadership in 2025 with the exit of Todd Curley after 11 years. Subiaco, there up, was Greg Clark's first half of the season. I mean, when he came back from the West Coast Eagles, and looking at his early numbers in uh, in the season, I thought he was going to be a major key to accompany the likes of uh, Hickmott, Kitchens, Sokol, Angus Dewar, but then obviously when he uh, suffered that season-ending in- injury, it just really finished off the conti- the continuity of the Lions midfield. They just weren't the same after Greg Clark went out. Yeah, he had a big start to the return to the waffle, to no surprise really. He actually pulled really well in the sand over until, yes. he, um, until he did get injured. So it would have been interesting to happen, see what happened there had he continued on. But uh, 
yeah, I guess a bit of lack of a solid team balance between youth and experienced players. But mm. as we sort of said during the year, I think uh, blooding these young guys is only going to hold them in, in good stead. And potentially knowing that they were going to miss finals for probably a little while could have been a little bit of a, a blessing in disguise to be able to blood these guys and see what they're like heading into an enormous uh, 2025. And they just need more running players, you know, that it's like that genuine pace they had in, uh, in the year gone by when they won all those premierships. Swan Districts is next. What about their rise up the ladder? Weren't they a great team to watch? And the crowd, the loyal Swan Districts fans, they joined in for the ride. They did, and yeah, disappointing the way it finished in, in, in that preliminary final, but uh, they were battled and bruised. Let's make no mm. mistake about that. But uh, yeah, uh, if you had have said that would reach a preliminary final at the start of the year, I think a lot of people would have taken that. And um, yeah, to to play the way they did as well and to, to get the recruits so seamlessly into waffle footy mm. from an outside point of view. Nick um, Rokar, one of yeah. them being a joint standover medalist. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, obviously the down, probably losing Clark and Turner at the worst possible time, really, in the same game. Yeah, that was, of course, the qualifying final where they beat Peel Thunder in Mandra, but, of course, losing Clark through suspension and Turner through injury, that really put a big dent on the rest of their finals campaign. But a spectacular side they were to watch. I mean, not only the likes of Rokar, Clark and Turner, but Edwards in the forward line. He was clutch uh, when it mattered the most, often the final quarter specialist, as some may say, in the WAFL. But you also have the returning Lee Coleman, who was a monster in front of goal. He was sensational. And also the likes of Kelly, Pina and Lynch near the back line. Uh, the West Coast Eagles next up. Uh, their up was that they were finally able to compete against the likes of East Fremantle, Claremont, West Perth and win as well. When you look at those wins against East Fremantle, Claremont and West Perth, there were signs that they can be competitive. And that's good for the WAFL competition. You want the Eagles to be competitive, but not to the detriment of the other clubs. Yeah, it's true. It's, uh, it's a good point. I think West Coast, uh, yeah, to, to win those games um, was second to none, really. And, you know, best season, I think, since 2019 in the waffle. You know, obviously, still finished fairly low on the set, on the ladder. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, their future in the waffle competition maybe looks a little bit brighter than some may suspect. Absolutely. But the same old story here, and this is where the down comes into the equation. You know, cons- consistent smashings. They're beaten by 80 to 100 points on a regular basis and a lack of a best 22, you know, when you're filled by, you know, AFL players that, you know, aligned with the West Coast Eagles system and also amateurs in the Perth Football League, you know, that don't train in the full-time schedule like the Eagles AFL players and the Peel players in the Dockers system do. So I reckon there's got to be you know, a deep look at this as to where the Eagles can improve on in 2025. Yeah, hopefully they can recruit sort of interstate and obviously with a lot of delistings happening in the AFL at the moment, I think that could be a real um, a real key avenue for them. You know, you saw Trey Rusko come to the side this year. He was a real bonus. So I think if they can add more players like that potentially um, and not screw around with the Eagles um, AFL listed players, then uh, yeah, they'll be in decent stead. But I still have a fair way to, to go to be sort of around the finals mark. And, ra- and finally, wrapping things up on our up and down section of that was the season that was 2024 as West Perth. The first two rounds, they started well, wins against Claremont and Perth, and that was pretty much it, to be honest with you. I mean, a long sequence of nine straight losses. And to add to that, the forward line never looked the same after Scaife went to Hawthorne. Jasper Scaife, that is, after starting so well in the league side inside 50 for 2024. Their forward line lacked the uh, synergy that we saw two years ago when they won their premiership. Uh, They often relied on Tyler Keitel, who at times got it done, but when he was held down, no one provided support inside that 50. And there are a lot of those players that I reckon are going to be looking at their futures uh, come 2025. Yeah, quite a bit of of change happening at West Perth. You feel... uh yeah, you can never really prepare for a Jasper Scaife leaving mid-season. You know, they obviously would have hoped the best for him, but you can't prepare for that at the start of the year and you can't just replace him interstate or anything like that when he, when it happens. Uh, so, yeah, I think it might have hurt a little bit um, that he didn't even play for Hawthorne as well. I think right. that might have, you know, hurt them a little bit. Obviously, he's still there and they wish him all the best. But, uh, yeah, Tyler Cartel, you know, he's only getting on with age. He did win the club's leading uh, goal kicker yet again. But and the Bernie Nala medal as well. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, you can't fault him too much. Guys like not on that, you'd expect potentially coming to the end of that. But uh, that only provides opportunities for, for future. Um, you know, Kyle Duran, they blooded him lately. Yeah, he's likely big. to get picked up. So, yeah, it's uh, West Perth. There's still a bit happening there. But, um, yeah, I think to say they're in the rebuild, as we said, on the show this year would, would be an understatement. Yeah, it would be a transitional phase for uh, the West Perth Football Club and hopefully better fortunes in 2025. That's the up and downs of your WAFL team. Let us know uh, on our socials and on our YouTube and uh, podcast pages. What were some of the ups and downs of your club, whether you support Claremont, East from Adelaide, East Perth, or any WAFL team in season 2024. This is Around the Waffles. That was the season that was 2024. 
Let's go now, Rothy, to the top five games of this season. We did a lot of searching, and uh, some people will be impressed, some people will not. If we didn't include one of your favourite games, let us know, and uh, we'll uh, make sure that we do in the future. Uh, well, well let, let, but let's go to it. Uh, it's a bit of a tough countdown, this one, considering how close the season was. Number five is West Coast and East from Mantle back in round three. I mean, that was, along with West Perth Claremont round one, when West Perth came back from four goals down to beat Claremont, this was the first real shock of 20. 24. It was, yeah. I don't think any, anyone saw this coming. And, uh, yeah, it has to be in the top five purely just from a from a surprise packet point of view, you'd have to say. Absolutely. But, but, it, but it proved that, you know, it was a good sign that the Eagles are going to be competitive. As it turned out, they were in patches for 2024. And to beat the reigning premiers, no less, it was a really big scalp at the time. We were thinking this could be the signs of maybe a great revival for the Eagles. And when you, when you think about it, it it's crazy because... You know, East Roman will miss out on top three, which we know is such mm. a big advantage. And they go out in the first week of the finals. Now, mm. what happens if West Coast, you know, they, they don't win that game? It's it's really, you know, but I don't think people quite realise that literally every game matters. And mm. that you can look back in the season and, and think, wow, like if we won that game, like things could be so much different. Yeah, as the old an- analogy goes, if you're 5% off your game, you're going to get beaten. I'm afraid East Fremantle found that out. Let's go now to the next game, the draw between South Fremantle and Swan Districts. That also posed a big difference as far as the latter is concerned. If Swan Districts got the four points, they would have hosted the first final and maybe a greater chance to make the grand final. But uh, there were some big moments in that last quarter. Swans looked to have had it. South Fremantle came back and then Manfred Kelly kicked it behind to uh, pinch the two points. Gee, it was a lot of tension over there at Frio Oval. Yeah, you feel for Manfred Kelly, although I think the week later uh, he scored a sealer to, to sort of redeem yes. himself in that sense. So, Correct. Uh, at least, you know, he, he sort of uh, responded from that. But, uh, yeah, you can never be too harsh on a player sort of after the, the siren. Uh, the pressure's palpable. So, yep, uh, as we always say in a draw, you know, one team probably felt like they came away with one. One team probably felt like they let one slip. Absolutely. Number three, we like to call it the McDonald game in round five on the Anzac Day Sunday. South from our, East from Adel, rather, and Swan Districts. We love this moment. I mean, Jackson McDonald kicking a goal from the McDonald stand, and Darren McDonald, who, who sounded like he did a night of karaoke the previous night, calling that moment. But it wasn't just that moment. I mean, momentum ebbed and flowed. There was nothing in it, and uh, it all came down to that one kick after the siren. He's very sort of saved the season almost in a yeah. sense, that, that game. There was a lot of pressure. On them, but yeah, I just don't know if that will ever happen again with the McDonald trifecta. You yeah. say, I just yeah, it's uh, it's right up there for mine as as you'll probably hear later on. No doubt about it. Uh, what about number two, the first semi final between Peel Thunder and Claremont? Now it wasn't a high scoring, we get that, but it had everything. There was a lot of tension in that game. Peel pulled away briefly, then Claremont pulled away in the last quarter, and a great Peel comeback got them over the line. I think Peel Thunder may have won that premiership in that first semi-final because the way they teamed in that last quarter and how hungry they were for the next two finals. And think about this, if Blair Bell missed that shot at goal, that would have been his last game. So he saved his career by two weeks. Yeah, it's uh, the margin between error is just so such a fine line. And um, yeah, I've, I've actually heard a few people saying that if Claremont won, that they could have done an appeal thunder and gone all the way. So yeah, you could argue that that was sort of the deciding game. Absolutely. But uh, what a game it certainly was. That's what finals footy is all about, right down to the wire. And then the number one game of 2024 is the first Perth Derby on the WA Day. It was a great game. 6,000 over there at Pentanet Stadium. And there was nothing in it all day. Day. East Perth jumped briefly. They were three goals ahead, but West Perth came back almost immediately. And the margin never ballooned above three goals for the entire day. And both the sides just gave it everything. They, they left nothing to the uh, to the imagination. It was an incredible game. Yeah, congratulations on that call again. That's, Thank uh, you. Yeah, it was yes first class, but um, yeah, a good old-fashioned derby. And I think what adds to this is it sort of re um, states that no matter what position these sides are on the, the ladder, the Derby is a different game. Oh, like, yeah. You know, we are talking earlier in the show about how it's been a disappointing year for West Perth and a successful year for East Perth, but you wouldn't have known watching this Derby no. that these guys were opposite ends of the ladder. You felt like it was a clash between first and second, judging by the crowd, and they... they 
they absolutely absorbed every second of it, the crowd, and uh, it was absolutely magnificent. And, and seeing, you know, the East Perth players after the game, they were thinking that they were in for a hell of a contest, and they certainly got one. And they were a bit lucky as well. Um, you know, they missed a couple of shots, and uh, they even said themselves that uh, West Perth may have won the game as well uh, with a couple of those moments as well. But East Perth got the chocolates there only just. That's the number one game of 2024. Let us know well, what some of your favourite games were in 2024. This is Around the Waffles. That was the season that was 2024. Top five players, Rothy, of 2024. Number five, Isaiah Winder. He was a real revelation for South Fremantle. I'd have to say a bit stiff not to get uh, more sand over votes. Yeah, I'm right. We're right there with you. He was a smoky for mine. So, uh, yeah, obviously I'm part of it a bit differently, which is okay, but that doesn't take it away from a successful year. Yeah, great midfielder, a great carry on the ball, and uh, a great disciplinarian as well. He's, he's driven to deliver not only for his team, but also for himself as well. His team, more importantly, he's got great driver uh, up in the midfield and self-belief in that midfield unit. I reckon he'll form a good part of the nucleus led by uh, Craig White. New coach in 2025. Number four, Neil Erasmus, the uh, the Simpson medalist from the grand final. He played a remarkable final series. He was dangerous, he was efficient, and he showed great intent. Yeah, he was the difference for mine, and only sort of staking his claim even more for AFL selection. So, yeah, Neil Erasmus, uh, Simpson medal. Um, you know, a lot of people predicted it, and, and he came through with it. So I think he, he, you know, it's not always easy to sort of live up to the hype or live up to the expectation of just coming in having 30 disposals and kicking goals, but mm. he just did it. And his, his fitness as well also proved a big difference as well. He looked polished. He looked fit as a fiddle, as he always does yeah, in these big matches, and uh, he delivered when it matters the most. And I can't compare these two ruckmen. I put in Scotty Jones solo, but I've got to put both Scotty Jones and Oliver Eastland in number three. I mean, what a season they both had in the ruck. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, those two are probably leading this two-horse race for the best rucks in the competition. And uh, anytime they go head-to-head, it's a real challenge. But, you know, you often see that anytime they verse any other rucks, it's a challenging day for the opposing rucks. And they've both got good follow-up as well. You know, they're not just good tap-out ruckmen. You know, they can do so much more around the ball. Yeah, it's good to recognise rucks as well. And they might be forgotten sometimes and uh, maybe not get the credit, but they're an important cog in, in any side. Absolutely. And this player also flew a little bit under the radar, especially at the Sandover medal count, Callan England of the Claremont Football Club. Uh, he achieved a lot this year. I mean, he averaged over 27 disposals, won the Sandover medal along with Nick Rokar, who we're going to list in just a moment. But uh, also the way he was able to generate run and carry through the middle and even generate some scoreboard pressure up forward. He was such a real key for Claremont, especially in their second half of the season when they won on that winning run of nine from 11. Yeah, absolute depth uh, added to the Clement midfield with a Sandover medal. So, yeah, probably no one saw saw it coming on Sandover night. But, uh, yeah, he's uh, had a remarkable year, year, really. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, like he, he's probably not even in his prime yet, 24, 25 years of age. Yeah, only 24, 25 years of age. But uh, he's still got plenty of years of great waffle footy in him uh, over at the Claremont Football Club. And, of course, Nick Rokart, dual Sandover medalist uh, as well from Swan Districts, coming over from Norwood in South Australia, where he was a runner-up in the McGarry medal a couple of years ago. He has taken great South Australian flair over to Swan Districts. And uh, that's a, a great style that uh, that I reckon the Swans were missing, a little bit of interstate flair in the, in the last couple of years to... Like what Perth did this year, they got some interstate recruits, but the way they were able to be utilised by Coach Andrew Prune was such a big difference. Prune utilised Rokar to his role and the best of his abilities. He notified them so well, and Rokar, he absolutely capitalised on every single opportunity he got, and he deserves to be one of those Sandover medalists he in does, 2024. Yeah. Ball magnet, and uh, it just makes you wonder, you know, more waffle clubs sort of going to be eyeing interstate, interstate talent as well as, you know, developing their own local talent now, but... Uh, yeah, there's a few names linked to, to clubs, and I think Nick Rokar is a perfect example that a guy can come in and uh, double double heartbreak with a McGarry medal in the first year, comes and wins the most prestigious water in the waffle. Uh, it's just a testament to, to him and, uh, and the Swan Districts and, and Phil Smart for recruiting him. Incredible stuff, and uh, they were certainly sensational, those uh, five or six players that we just mentioned to you on our top players for 2024. This is, that was the season that was, 2024, here on Around the Waffle. Let's go over now each of some of our season highlights from a personal point of view. Uh, we'll go over this for about a minute or so. Rothy, uh, I'll let you go first, mate. Uh, some of your favourite moments of, uh, the, of the season. Yeah, so just touching on the Sandover, I have the Sandover tie as my uh, third yes. uh, season highlight. I just think first time since 2005, it's a long time. And yes, it was a low count, but I think that made it even more exciting. And uh, it's always good when you see someone who maybe not 
was not sort of a number one favourite or wasn't spoken about, you know, get up and just get the recognition that they deserve. So that would be my third one. My second one would be McDonald's goal after the side. Oh, yeah. Um, I just, I just don't think that will ever happen really in terms of the, the trifecta of the name, but also the moment, season yeah. the moment, um, the goal after the siren. At, at Steel Blue went up, uh, the comeback as well from, from a Sharks point of view, can't beat that. And then speaking of the Sharks, for number one, um, the first Frio Derby with 7,000 crowds. Amazing. So I was weighing up between that and the prelim with also 7,000 there, but just went for the first the first 7,000. Um, the first Derby in a close game as well, you know, East Frio obviously, um, you know, it was sort of, they closed the gap sort of late. Um, they did, but Dylan Main, he was, he was on fire. He got the ball rolling for the Bulldogs. That really set up the victory, and the Bulldogs are playing catch-up football. But you're right, the crowd was just awesome. Yeah, and I think when doing these highlights, it was very hard to just nail them into three. But I think yeah. sort of, um, I was sort of thinking what came to my mind first if I was sort of was to find 2024. And I just think that derby sort of resonates with um, the evenness of the competition, the crowd, the support, and just everything as a whole. It's a nice little lead in it as well. I'll give you my first highlight of 2024, that first game. That was a sign that this season was going to be a banger. And the new concept as well of Waffle Wonderland, which I have to say, give the WA Football Commission a massive tick in the box. They did a wonderful job in promoting that. We saw great crowds, and it all started with that first game. Under lights at Pentanet Stadium in June, love. And it was a thriller as well with uh, West Perth winning by two points. And that was a sign that this season was going to be a ripper. Darcy Craven's mark in round eight against Brisbane. I have to put in Tom Edwards' mark as well because that one was the mark of the year. No surprise about that. It was an absolute ripper over there in the wet at Lane Group Stadium in round 20. So both those marks come to mind. Darcy Craven's won a little bit more in context because he got drafted by Brisbane later in the season. And the John Todd Memorial game over at uh, Steel Blue Oval, very emotional occasion, celebrating the life of a giant of the game. You know, they're not going to make giants of the game like that again in the WAFL. His influence on football is in this state will never be forgotten. We are going to miss you, Toddy. Now, before we uh, close for season 2024, time to get some early predictions for 2025. What's the crystal ball like looking? I'll go first. I reckon the Swans will make the five again in 2025, but I reckon they'll finish on top. I reckon that they can capitalise on a season that they had. They won't be too disappointed by reaching a preliminary final. Big crowd, the fan support rode with them all the way. They've got some great depth from uh, the local contingent as well as the interstate recruits that they had. And Andrew Prune's a hell of a coach. He's got a magnificent game plan, and I reckon they can you know charge up the ladder even more in uh, 2025. And Hamish Free, he recently was announced uh, as the new ruckman for South Fremantle, having been delisted by North Melbourne in the AFL. I reckon he'll be leading the hit out. To just ahead of Scott Jones in uh, 2025. So watch out for Hamish Free back at Bulldog Land in 2025. What about you, Rothy? Yeah, I'll just quickly say on, on those couple of points, yeah, perfect player that South Man will need. They sort of need that, that bona fide ruck. And uh, in terms of Swans, yeah, I'm right there with you. I think uh, they might be eyeing a couple of guys like Ethan Hughes and Zane Shrew. Mm. You know, I mean, nothing's been confirmed and, and that sort of thing. But they are local talents and, and Swan District's people. So mm. um, obviously Zane Shrew is a very close connection to Jake Pacini. So That's right. um, that could be on the cards. But in terms of mine... Um, I think East Fremantle may, and I say may, miss the five, mm. potentially. I just think with guys like Jupp retiring, Boker, Schoenfeld, um, I think potentially, you know, I'm, I'm not saying they'll go, you know, wooden spooners or anything like that, but I don't necessarily see them charging up the ladder and, and sort of, um, you know, getting potentially back to where they did it in 2023. Big, big pick. And you also touched on a couple of the draftees as well. You, you even thought about one particular Peel player as well. Yeah, I think Michael Selwood has the potential to be drafted. I know there was a little bit of talk in the mid-season this year, but uh, he's done his chances no harm, you know, rebounding defender, taking those marks and... Uh, I think, uh, you know, you only have to look at someone like a Lawson Humphreys. You just get the opportunity in the AFL. You can really relish with the preseason and the professional environment and the resources. So for a Peel Thunder point of view, they'd love to keep him. Not saying it'll happen sort of this year in this November draft, potentially the mid-season draft, as we've seen with the Jacob Blight. Peel Thunder have had a, a pretty good record in the mid-season draft. They you have. Think of, you think of, um, you know, guys like... Uh, you know, Blight and even um, Wade Dirksen, who went to the Giants. So, that, right. so they're, you know, they're pretty well stocked in that sense. So I think Selwood, watch out for him. Absolutely. Well, keep an eye on uh, your draft choices at the Brian Ethan Show, where you do a wonderful job with that as well. And with that in mind, that does it for season 2024. It's been a wonderful season here on Around the Waffle. I'd just like to send out a couple of thank yous to all the 10 WAFL clubs that uh, allowed us to uh, have the players and the coaches on the show. We really appreciate it. Uh, you provide a great source of access 
access uh, to this wonderful podcast and to all in the WAFL media circles. We'd also like to thank the West Australian Football Commission, led by the likes of Karina uh, Conti, Nikki Brown, uh, Will Rulo and company for their support of Around the Waffle. We really do appreciate it. And we also like to thank you, the listeners and the viewers that tune in each and every week across the season for Around the Waffle, your go-to WAFL podcast in 2024. We'd also like to thank the likes of Mark Reddings, David Lindsay, Dan Hobley, Andrew Henry on for filling in the co-host chair and also my main man, Ethan Roth, my right-hand man for season 2024. You've done a wonderful job, mate, of rising up the ranks from the Colts to the big league and uh, you've done a wonderful job in your first season. Paul, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to come on the show this year. I think the biggest thank you from everyone in the Waffle community has to go to you. You know, you've first and foremost given me an opportunity to come on the show this year and, and I guess add an extra platform with my media. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I can't wait for 2025 already. But on top of that, you know, I think people might not realise, yes, we do the show, but it's all the work behind the scenes, collating the guests, doing all the socials, the run sheet, um, you know, at short notice a lot of the time with your other commitments as well. And, and just putting everything together behind the scenes. Um, it's a lot harder work uh, than people think, obviously, having a podcast of my own. So, um, yeah, I think on behalf of the Waffle community, sort of um, your passion for the Waffle cannot be sort of um, questioned one bit. So thank you and enjoy the summer with your other commitments as well. And uh, can't wait for 2025. Really appreciate it, mate. The passion for WAFL never dies down. Have a wonderful summer, everybody. Uh, where, whatever it is that you do, whether you go to uh, watch the baseball, the basketball, ball, the cricket or whatever it is, but we can't wait to have your company once again in season 2025. It's been another great year. You've been listening to Around the Waffle, your go-to WAFL podcast in 2024. We'll see you next year.